good afternoon, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the second day of our webinar for SBL June 2023 attempt, and this is Hassan Dosan. I hope you guys are keeping well, and uh, yesterday we had our first day in which we primarily looked at the introduction to SBL, then we looked at all the formats, then we looked at all the professional skills, and then we did a interesting question yesterday uh, regarding risk management and recommendations, right? So let's kick off with our today's um, uh, webinar. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, here you go. So this is the game-changing webinar series for June 2023, day two, SBL. And oh yes, yesterday we also did an interesting thing. We had a chat with the global prize winner of the previous attempt, remember? Rahul Bikram, who scored 92 marks, not 93. And he shared a lot of his experience, his study approach, his examination approach, so I hope you guys benefited from that. In case those of you who missed yesterday's webinar can watch the recording on YouTube after two days, okay? So both these webinars, day one and day two are being recorded and they will be uploaded on YouTube after two days, right? And as discussed yesterday, this Ma this June 2023 webinar is not enough for you to cover the entire SBL. Um, you need to watch some previous webinars so that you can, you know, have a comprehensive coverage if you are a self-study student. How can you ask questions? You need to type your questions in the chat box. And after every couple of slides, I will take a pause. I will go through your comments and your questions and will answer them. Just make sure that your question relates to the slide under discussion, okay? Do not ask any non-relevant or general question. For that, I will allocate few minutes after the webinar. Okay, most of you know me by now, but those of you who don't, this is my uh, WhatsApp number. You can save it so that you can get in touch with me. Also, I'm running, managing a global WhatsApp group for SBL. If you are not part of any global WhatsApp group as yet, please message this number and you will be shared the link. In fact, I will share the link right now. Uh, I am sharing the link right now so that if those of you who haven't joined as yet can click on this and join this group. Okay. Now let's get cracking. I will, because you're all fresh right now, let us start with exam techniques. Exam techniques is the the actual key to pass SBL. It is not the preparation stage, it is actually those four hours. How you manage those four hours will decide whether you will pass or not. A student who has studied extremely hard, he's done all the syllabus, he's done the practice, webinars, but if he screws up in those four hours, if he does not apply proper exam techniques, he will not pass, right? He or she. And a student who has not studied properly, but he actually followed the exam techniques, he was able to cover, complete the paper, he was able to link with the exhibits, there are high chances he or she will pass. So actually for SBL, I don't know about other subjects, it might be different for other subjects, but for SBL, the 80% uh, depends on your exam techniques and how you behave, how you manage during those four hours. Do you agree? Yeah. So let's start. I will spend like at least 30, 40, 50 minutes on this topic because it is so important. 
So the first thing first, what do you do when you open the paper? So you sit in front of the PC and time starts. What's the first thing you will do? You need to copy paste all technical requirements on your Word tool in the CBE platform. That's the first thing you need to do. Copy paste all technical requirement, only the technical requirement, not the background, not the professional skills, only the technical requirement paragraph, you need to copy it on your word tool. I'll show you how, and I will explain why. So let me open up my EEE CBE platform. Okay, and this was the yesterday's question, QH, September, December. So let's say I open up this paper. The first thing I will do is I will open up my word processor. Let me just clean this a bit. Okay, I will open up my word processor. And I will just put it on one side. And I will quickly, quickly, quickly copy paste all the technical requirements. So I will open task number one. I will just copy this technical requirement. Just double click, uh, triple click, one, two, three. Just triple click and the entire paragraph will be selected. It's a fast time saving technique, three clicks, together, one, two, three, and the paragraph is selected. Control C, you come here and you write Control V. What is the question number? It is task one, okay? Then you enter, 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 leave three lines, go to task number two, uh, triple click, Control C, come here. Let me reduce this screen a bit so that it's easier for me to navigate. Why is it not working? Let me close it. No, that's the shortest it can get. Okay. Triple click, control V, then I go here. Is there any other requirement? No, that's it. I close this and I put the number two. Enter, enter, enter. Then I will open task number three, triple click, control C, control V. There are two tasks here, triple click, control C, control V. I will just number it's 3A and it is 3B, done, close it, task number four. Triple click, control C, come here, control V, and then four B and four A. I will close this and triple click, and task number five has two parts, control C. Control V, Control C. You have to be very fast at it, okay? More practice will give you more speed. Done. So in approximately two minutes, I have copy pasted all the requirements sequentially in my word tool. Can you see this? All right. Now, why did I copy paste all the tech technical requirements? Because I want them all in one place. Because if you look at the CBE, all the tasks are scattered. They are not together. They are all separate exhibits. So it's not practical for me every time to open up each and every requirements. So what I did was I brought all the technical requirements on one page. So after you've copied it, you need to read the technical requirements so that you can identify the main topic or the main requirements of each part, all right? So can anybody tell me why do you need to identify what are what is the key topic or requirement for each part? What is the need to identify 
why, why you need to read the requirements in one go? Why do you need to know which requirement or which topic is, has been, is being asked? Exactly. So that when we are reading the exhibits, we know which points or information to look for. For example, if we know that we have to do a pastel analysis, then while reading the exhibit, I will identify the factors relating to pastel. If, if, if the question asks you to identify risks, then while I'm reading the exhibits, I will keep my eyes open for risks. So it's absolutely important to you know, understand and even possible try to memorize. So for example, the first part is saying prepare a report for the board which evaluates the key external drivers of change which are likely to impact QH in the next five years. So what is the topic here? We have to evaluate the key external drivers. Huh? So I just bold it. Key external drivers means external factors like pestel and portafile. So when I'm reading, I have to keep at the back of my head that I need to look for pestel and portafile. Prepare a report for the CEO which advise on the role of integrated reporting and its value to both QH and its wider stakeholders. So what is the topic here? What is the topic here in question number two? integrated reporting. So I will just highlight integrated reporting. Wherever I see any words relating or any information relating to integrated reporting, I will highlight it. What about 3A? Draft a memo for the CEO to send to all housing development site controllers, which advises on the strategic importance to QH of sound cost management and control. What is the topic here? Now, yeah, uh, I uh, just uh, type your answers, okay? Because this is a global group, I do not want verbal participation. I hope you understand. Sorry for that. 3B draft a confidential memo for the CEO which assesses the ethical issues and business stress faced by QH as a result of the matters discussed and comments made at the site controller meeting. So we need to, the topic is ethical issues and business threats from this site controller meeting. You see? So we, you will have to first copy paste all the technical requirements. Then you have to read the technical requirements so that you exactly know what are the topics or questions which are being asked. And when we are reading the exhibits, we will again and again refer to this list so that you know we are able to identify information or exhibits. Got it? Uh, let me just uh, separating current audit and risk committee. I'm just completing this. Okay, done. Now someone was asking that if we just copy uh, technical requirements, what about the professional skills? So we are not reading the requirement as of now in full. We will read the full requirement at the time when we will start the drafting. So the purpose of this list is just to summarize the topic so that we are able to link with the scenario. When we act, start the actual drafting of the answer, at that time, I will read the background, I will read the technical requirement in more detail, and I will read the professional skills, I will plan my number of points, I will see the format, all those things will be done at that time. All right, Sajna, I will come to that. So you understood what is the first step? Copy paste all technical requirements and then you read it so that we know the topics, right? The second step is then we have to go through the list of exhibits. We should know which exhibits have been provided to our, what are those exhibits? For example, if you go back to this scenario, which exhibits are there? 
So there is an overview, which is always there. This will tell us the background. Then there is extracts from the website. So I know that there is a website. Then there is an annual report. Okay. Then there is an economic outlook report. Okay. It, what it will tell us, I think it will tell us about the external factors, the economic outlook of the country. Then there is cost management and control activities. Then there is a senior management meeting extract. Then there is risk management proposal. And then is, there is report on poor customer service. So in total, there are eight exhibits in this particular scenario. So <clears throat> We need to now decide which exhibits are one is too many and which exhibits are one is too one. Understood? Identify one is too many exhibits versus one is too one. So what is the meaning of one is to one exhibit? Can you guys guess? What is the meaning of, guys, can you please stop chatting between yourself? Otherwise, I need to block you, okay? Please do not chat amongst yourself. You are flooding my chat box. Please try to understand, all right? Just focus here. What is the meaning of one is to one exhibit? These are those exhibits which pertains to one question. So one is to one, and anyway. one exhibit, one requirement. So these are those exhibits which are pertaining to uh, one particular question. Please, guys, the one. You. Yeah, there you these are those exhibits which pertains to one specific question. So normally, these one is to one exhibits are smaller in size. They are half page. They are less than one page. They are smaller because they just contain information about one particular question and you can judge them from their name as well. For example, if there are only financials, it's normally one is to one. Any newspaper article is one is to one or any weird specific topic is one is to one. What about one, one is too many exhibits? Any idea what is a one is too many exhibits? What is the meaning of one is too many exhibits? So there's one exhibit which covers multiple questions. So it is an exhibit which contains a variety of information which we can use in multiple requirements. It may contain information for two questions or three questions. So normally these Exhibits are relatively lengthier. They are more bigger than one is to one because they contain a variety of information which can be used in multiple questions, right? What are the examples of one is too many? Normally the board minutes, meeting transcripts, annual report, website. These are some typical exhibits which are generally one is too many. All right, got it. So <clears throat> what we will do? So now overview we have to read. So actually, sorry. The main thing is once you identify one is too many and one is too one, and it's not difficult, I will show you how. Then you have to read the one is too many exhibits only and move towards drafting your answers. Do you understand that? That's very important. So the purpose of identifying exhibits, one is too many versus one is too one is, so that in the initial reading time, you just need to focus on the one is too many exhibits. Forget about the one is too one. As soon as you read one is too many exhibits, it could be two, it can be three. Then you move towards drafting. Right. So when do we read the one is to one? So you will read the one is to one exhibit when you actually attempt that particular question. 
So we will just identify the one is to one, but we will read it later when we are about to start drafting of that question, because it's a one is to one. So we exactly know which question uh, we need to use this exhibit. So there is no point in reading it in advance. We will read it once we start that question. Clear? So let's see. Overview, we have to read. Overview is one is too many. What about extracts from map side, guys? One is too one, one is too many. Extract from website. One is too many. Oh, fuck, man. Who's this one is too one? Shit, man. I just mentioned three minutes back, what are the examples of one is too many? Look at this fucking list. Okay, what about the third one, annual report? Annual report is one is too many as well. Regardless of the size, just remember board minutes, meeting transcripts, annual reports, website. Generally, these are one is too many because they contain multiple information, right? <laughs> Okay, what about Morlia's economic outlook report? So it is a very specific thing. It is, it will tell us about the economic outlook report uh, of the country. Morlia is the country, right? And if you look at the size, it is also one pager. But so what do you think? Morlia economic outlook report. Riskan, I will come to that. It's generally one is to one. Morlia's economic outlook report. So it will talk about external factors, right? If you look, just take a quick look. The housing market. What is the meaning of housing market? Housing market means housing industry. This will provide us information about the external factors the economy, the government, the social, the techno, the eco, the external factors, customers, competition. Is there any requirement which talks about external factors? Is there any requirement? Because we just made a list of requirement few minutes back, right? So is there any requirement in which we are supposed to talk about external factors? Which question is that? Let me know the question number, please. Because we have this, so you see, that is why this list is so effective that you know I can immediately go back. So I can see that key external drivers. So I will write here, exhibit, exhibit four. I will just mention here that for this question, I need to refer to exhibit four. Do you understand this cross-referencing that I just identified an exhibit and allotted it to uh, that respective question? Okay, what about cost management and control activities? Again, a very specific, weird topic. And I remember there is some question on cost management. Can you tell me know the question number, please? Tell me the task number from your Word document. Yeah, it's here, sound cost management and control, 3A. So I will go here, I will write exhibit number. Okay, what about senior management meeting extracts? So normally senior management meeting extracts are one is too one or one is too many. Okay, so I will have to read them, okay. What about risk management proposal? A very specific heading. It will, I know it will talk about risk management. Is there a question on risk management? Yeah, this one. I will write exhibit seven, cross-referencing, okay? And what about report on poor customer service? Again, by heading it, I know it will talk about poor customer service. Was there a question here? Yeah. 
So we identified one, two, and three, and four exhibits are one is too many. This one, this one, this one, and then this one. There are four exhibits which are one is too many. So out of eight, there are four exhibits which are one is too many. Oh, sorry, one is too one. So there will be four exhibits which are one is too many, right? So which, so I will now read which one? Which exhibits am I supposed to read? I will read one. I will read exhibit two. I will read exhibit three. Then this one is one is two one. This one is one is two one. And then I will read six. So one, two, three, and six you will need to read. One, two, three, and six exhibits are one is too many. I will need to read them to allocate them to the respective questions. But other than these four, the remaining four exhibits are one is two one. And I have mentioned their numbers under the respective questions. Done. So, so far, what we have done, number one, we copy pasted all the requirements. Then we read all the requirements to identify the topics or requirements. Then we went through the list of exhibits to identify one is too one versus one is too many. And we cross referenced one is too one. All this activity should take you approximately 10 minutes. Okay, how many minutes you think? 10 minutes is okay. Less than 10. Okay, I'm giving it on a higher side. So it all depends on your speed. The more you will practice this technique, the faster you will get. Do you understand that? You remember yesterday's input from Rahul? He is the global prize winner. He said that he used to spend 80% of the time on practice. So you have to practice, right? You have to do at least seven, eight full case studies. So the more you will do this, the more faster you will get. So I think six, seven, eight minutes is okay, but maximum 10 minutes. Otherwise you will be screwed. It's all about speed and time management, all right? <clears throat> now look at this overview. So we have to read one, two, three, and six. So this page is a uh, overview is a one pager how much time will it take you to read approximately in your view look at the first exhibit the overview how much time it will take you approximately five minutes okay not 10 minutes who the fuck is this osama my boy you will be screwed huh three to five minutes What about the second exhibit? Let's look at it. Is it a big one or a small one? It is a website thing. Our mission, our board. Oh, that's it. How much time for this, this exhibit? How much time for, no, 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 be realistic. I don't think one or two minutes is possible. Good, Usama. I think let's say, another five minutes. Okay, let's say five minutes, although it might be three to four minutes. Okay, then we will have to read the annual report. So it talks about our strategic objectives, one, two, three, four, and then there are certain graphs. Graphs will not take time, right? You can simply take a quick look. ROCE is falling, customer satisfaction, total staff training, waste generated, revenues, profit. This is maximum one less than one minute. And this one will take few minutes. So how much time in exhibit three? Six to eight minutes, perfect. Who said 15? No, Sama, unacceptable. So five minutes for exhibit one, five minutes for exhibit two, that's 10 and eight minutes for exhibit three. 
18 minutes. Okay. And then the sixth one, let's look at it. I'm just trying to calculate roughly the amount of time. So this is, there's a lot of stuff to read here. I would say 10 minutes. Hmm? 10 minutes, okay. So 18 minutes for the first three and then 10 minutes, 28 minutes. Let's say 30 minutes. 30 minutes is okay in total for you to read one, two, three, and six. Plus minus one or two minutes. Okay, I'm just talking about approximately you should finish reading by 30 minutes. Perfect. Now, the first 10 minutes was of planning. Remember? Not skimming, reading. The first 10 minutes was planning, identifying, copy pasting the requirements, and then 30 minutes to read one is too many. So, total how many minutes you have spent now? Total how many minutes you are in the exam? 40 minutes. Exactly. Perfect. So, generally, generally, most of the time, you will require 40 minutes, five minutes plus minus, depending on the size of the exhibit. Sometime it is less, sometime it could be slightly more, but just to give you an idea, approximately 40 minutes should be more than enough for all these things. Is that clear? Okay. So please, when you are practicing, target yourself, time yourself that you are able to do all this within 40 minutes or less, okay? Because if you significantly overrun this, you will uh, screw up your time management uh, going forward, right? So try to target that you need to do all this thing in 40 minutes, plus minus two, three minutes, I'm okay. All right, now I'll go back. So all this will take how many minutes? 40 minutes. Now the important thing is this one, that when you are reading the one is too many exhibits for which we have allocated 30 minutes for reading, when we read, what do we do? Someone just mentioned that we will skim through it. No, Baba, no skimming. Proper reading, okay? So when you will read, once you have read, so let me show you what to do. Let's talk about annual report, okay? So when you are reading strategic objectives, these are our strategic objectives. So do you remember there is one question in which we have to talk about strategic objectives? We did that question yesterday that we need to know our strategic objectives. So you just shade it and try to copy paste it in the relevant question, okay? So when we read anything, we will select, if we find something important, if we find any information which we know that we have to cover in our answer, we know there's a requirement relating to this, just copy paste that sentence, go to the word tool and paste it under the respective question paste that information under the respective question so that you are, what you are doing is you're trying to pick up some important information or some important uh, sentence and pasting it here so that you are gathering all the relevant information and putting it here under the respective question so that when you start drafting, you know which points to elaborate on. Do you understand this? Any questions? Yes, Sajana, absolutely. So all this is 40 minutes. 
As there is asking when copy paste will start during reading the exhibit at first or after reading. Hmm, interesting question. When do we copy paste? While we are reading that exhibit, or once we complete that exhibit, then we copy paste. Up to you. Up to you. What I generally do is when I'm reading, I just highlight the important stuff. Okay, yellow highlight. And once I've read the entire exhibit, then I quickly go through the highlighted stuff and wherever I feel this can be used, then I copy paste under the word tool. Okay. So I think you read first so that your tempo is not uh, disturbed. So read the entire exhibit first. So for example, if I'm reading this exhibit, Let's say this one. I will first read all the exhibits. I will just, when I'm reading, I think this portion is important. I will just highlight it. I will not copy paste it, but I will highlight it and then this is our board. Okay, once you've read this, then I will just quickly go through the highlighted one and think which, where I can use this information. And then I will, you know, copy paste this sentence, for example, control C, and let's say it is question number two, I will go here and paste it. Okay. So I'm just trying to pick up some relevant information and pasting it on my word tool. Is this clear up till now? All this is to be done in the first 40, 45 minutes. Identifying one is too one, one is too many. Reading one is too many and picking up, highlighting the important information and then copy pasting them under relevant questions. Most of you will be slow in this. Most of you will be slow in this because it involves a lot of reading, a lot of multitasking. You will need to go through the list of requirements again and again. It is multitasking happening in your brain, right? How will you overcome this? The only way to overcome this is do it more and more. It's just like swimming, right? So in the start, when you have learned your swimming, in the start, you will be swimming slow, right? But the more you will swim every day, you are swimming 30 minutes slowly and gradually, your swimming speed will increase, your stamina will increase. So the only way to do this is doing proper time-based practice. You understand the concept of KPI? You know what KPI is? Right, so you have to set your target. I need to do this all in 40 minutes and then you start and then you time yourself. Very, very important, right? Yeah, and you, you need to track yourself and it will improve every question you will do slowly and gradually you will improve. All right, let's move on. Before starting the actual drafting, I always suggest to prepare the skeleton of the answer, like the format, opening sentence, main heading, closure, like we did yesterday. Then when you actually start the drafting, I will first make the format so that you know I get rid of it in one go and then I start drafting. Do not make the formats for all questions in one go, no. What I mean is when you actually start a particular question, at that time you first make the skeleton and then start drafting. When you go to the next question, first make the format and everything, then start drafting, understood? Okay, now about time management. So the paper is four hours and the 
the suggested time for reading and planning and all these things is 60 minutes. And hence the drafting time is 180 minutes. Okay, that's as per the examiner. But the more important thing is, as per our strategy, we will just be reading one is too many exhibits, right? So then for you guys, mentally, you need to, instead of 60 minutes, you should try and wrap it up in 40 minutes, as we just discussed, that we will not be reading all the exhibits. We are just focusing and reading the one is too many exhibits. So your reading time should ideally be round about 40 minutes, which means that uh, if there are two 40 minutes available, 40 minutes is spent on reading and planning. The one is too many. So you have got 200 minutes left for drafting, got it? And this is what Rahul also did, the global prize winner. Yesterday, if you remember, he said, that he, he planned, he, he gave 40 minutes for the reading, whatever he can read in 40 minutes, then he started to move towards drafting. Is this clear? <clears throat> and then the allowed drafting time is 1.8 minutes per total marks. But if you are following this 40 minute rule, then the drafting time will be two minutes per total marks, right? 100 divided by 200 minutes. No, 200 minutes divided by 100 marks. One mark is two minutes. Got it? Now, the most important thing, what to do when your allowed drafting time is up? So when you you know, when you know that it is, a, so let's say if it's a 20 marks question, guys, can you please stop chatting in between and causing confusion? Nobody's asking what you will do. Thank you. So if it's a 20 marks question, how much time will you allocate for drafting? 40 minutes, right? Two minutes per mark. So if you start at, no, 42 minutes, because we are reading in 40 minutes time instead of 60, right? So if you start at 9 a.m., what time you will finish? So you, you need to complete that answer by 9.40, because if you start at nine o'clock and you have all allocated 40 minutes, so you need to finish it by 9.40. Supposing it is already 9.40 and your answer is not complete, what you will do? What did Rahul did? Remember I specifically asked him yesterday, what did the global prize winner did? He just completed that paragraph, whatever he, he was writing in between. He just completed that paragraph and he left that question and he moved on to the next question. Just complete whatever paragraph you are doing so that, so that you don't leave it abruptly in between. Complete that point which you are drafting. Forget about the remainder of that question and move on. In the end, let's say if you have few minutes left, you can always come back and complete this. Nobody is stopping you, right? In the end, if by chance you have five, seven, ten minutes extra, then you can always come back and complete it, right? But at that point in time, if your time is up, complete that point or paragraph and move on to the next one. It is easier said than done. I mean, it's easy to say, but it is difficult to apply it in the exam. 
but you will have to do it. Because in the start, you remember I said that if you screw up in the exam technique, you will fail. No matter how hard you have prepared, there is no room for fucking up in the exam techniques. You'll have to do it. What's the big deal? Just fuck off and move on to the next question. What's the big deal? What's so hard? If you are clear, if you are adamant that no, I will, I have to stick to time management. If you are adamant that I have to stick to time management, then fuck off. If it's, if it's not complete, let go. Time management for me is more important. So you have to keep time management as top priority in your head. This applies on reading as well. So we have allowed 40 minutes reading time, right? We have allowed 40 minutes reading time, reading and planning. As soon as 40 minutes is off, is up, fuck off. Time management is important. Move on. If the drafting is not complete in the allowed time, fuck off. Time so keep time management as top priority in your head. Do not fall in the time trap. Do not fall in the time trap. All right, man. Now, very simple. Number of points. What did Rahul said yesterday? How many marks per point he followed? Yeah, he followed two marks per point. Absolutely correct. And that's exactly what we will do as well. So we all know that in your paper, there is, there is a technical mark and a professional marks. And if you add the, them both, you will get total marks, correct? There is technical marks. There is separate marks for professional skills. If you add these together, you will arrive at total marks. So what we will do is we will follow two marks per point. That's what the examiner says that he expects uh, two marks for a well uh, drafted point. And you remember Rahul said one point is one paragraph. One point is one paragraph. So do not try to put multiple points in the same paragraph because it will look unprofessional. It will look big and fat and ugly. One point, one paragraph. Next point, next paragraph. Third point, third paragraph. So can anybody tell me if it is a 10 marks question? If it is a 10 marks question, how many points? Five points? Exactly. Ten. Who the fuck said six? Who's that? Mithul, God help you, my boy. I mean, why is this so complicated? I'm saying two marks per point. If it's a ten marks question, two, ten divided by two is straightforward five. Five points, okay? Not more than that. So for 10 marks, five points. How many paragraphs? How many paragraphs? Exactly five, because if, who the fuck said three paragraphs, Joey? Usama is saying 10 paragraphs. Guys, I, I suggest you don't comment because you know you're making my temper go high. I don't want to deal with such kind of students who don't understand what I spoke five just five minutes back. How many paragraphs for 10 marks? Five paragraphs. As I such just said. One point is one paragraph. So five points means five paragraphs, correct? How many minutes? 
for 10 marks. 20 minutes, very good, because we followed two minutes per mark. If you read and plan in the first 40 minutes, then you follow two minutes per mark. Right, so let me summarize everything for you. So for a 10 marks question, we need five points, which means five distinct paragraphs, and we have 20 minutes time. Agreed? Now for a 15 marks question. For a 15 marks question, how many minutes? How many minutes first? 30 minutes, very good, straight. How many points? 15 divided by two is 7.5. So seven or eight, depending on the availability of information. Seven points or eight points, depending on the availability of information, which means seven or eight paragraphs. Okay. Very good. Now, what should be the size of your paragraphs? A lot of students are asking that. The size of the paragraph should be three lines, four lines, including the copy pasted lines. I think four lines on your CBE platform. Three to four sentences is basically excluding the copy paste portion. I always prefer that you have an opening sentence from the exhibit and then elaborate on it. So three to four lines, maximum five lines per point. If it goes beyond that, then you are overwriting. Yes, Priyanka, I agree. He said three sentences, but he was explaining in his own words, right? So if you add the opening, uh, any information from the scenario, then three to four lines means three to four sentences normally. Four lines would mean three or four sentences, correct? Akshi, I'm not saying sentences, I'm saying lines. Please don't get confused. The size of the paragraph should be three to four lines. Okay, three to four lines, which should also include one sentence or one line from the exhibit. <sighs> Together, so the, the, if you copy paste some sentence from the exhibit, that plus your own elaboration should be three to four lines. All right. Now for there are few exceptions. So for example, yesterday we did a question on identify risk and give recommendation. Remember yesterday's question, there were two components. So first of all, we had to talk about the impact of the risk and then we had to give recommendation, right? So there were two things. So we have to talk about the uh, impact. This is one point worth two marks. And we have to give recommendation, which is another point worth two marks. So in this kind of question where there are two things, you have to talk about the impact and give recommendation. These will be considered as two points. They are two separate things. So how many marks? per risk, two for impact, two for recommendation. So we will divide by four in order to calculate the number of weaknesses or risks required. So if there, if it's a 12 marks question, if it's a 12 marks question, and the question says, identify the weaknesses and give recommendations, how many weaknesses will you talk about for a 12 marks question? Three weaknesses, right? So for, we will identify three weaknesses. We will talk about the impact and we will give recommendations. So it's, uh, you know, three, three weaknesses. So three plus three, three risks or three weaknesses plus three recommendations. 
So Venisha is asking if it's a 10 marks question, what we will do? So 10 divided by 4 is how much? 10 divided by 4 is 2.5. So I would say at least 2, maximum 3. Oh, go, Baba, go. I cannot see the screen. Now, if you want to score a bit more, so you can follow this technique as well, that in a finance-related question, give one extra point. If you want to score high, if you don't want to score high, it's okay. So in a finance related question, so there will normally, most of the time, there will be a question on finance. They might give you a financial projection. They might give you some ratio analysis. So finance related questions should be your strong area, right? You are finance students. So if you are supposed to do a ratio analysis, I'm sure you are expected to do good in that. So for example, if it's a ratio analysis question worth 10 marks, how many points should you give? If it's a ratio analysis question worth 10 marks, how many points? Six points. So normally five because 10 marks divided by two is five, but because it's a finance question, and it is your strong area, I would suggest you give one extra point to score one or two extra marks. So five plus one, six points, okay? But it's up to you. Um, just one minute, guys. I will just uh, let the cat out of the room. There is one more uh, complexity which I noted, and that's relating to... Um, Presentation slides. No, Aisha. Presentation slides, normally the examiner will tell you how many slides. Sometimes he will say prepare two slides. Sometimes he will say prepare three slides. Okay, he will exactly tell you how many slides he wants, correct? So if it's a 10 marks question, if it's a 10 marks question and you are supposed to prepare two slides, so first you will allocate marks per slide. So if it's a 10 marks question, guys, please control your comments, all right? Please. Huh? So if it's a 10 marks question and there are two slides, how many marks per slide? So first you will decide marks per slide. So if it's two slides, five plus five. And then for each slide, how many points? So if that slide is worth five marks, how many points per slide? Two to three. Very good, very good. If it's a 12 marks question and two slides, if it's a 12 marks question and two slides, how many marks per slide? Six marks per slide. And then how many points in a slide? Three points. Very good, simple. So in a slide question, the examiner will tell you how many slides. So you first allocate the marks per slide. And then for each slide, you can decide the number of points. Understood? Because the examiner will tell you how many slides is required. So you first divide the marks between the number of slides. And then you decide the points for each slide. Thank you. Good. Format of your answer, it's pretty simple. We've discussed most of this. Um, linking your answer is a must. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Linking your answer is a must. So while we are reading, we will be you know, picking up information from the exhibit. Adopt a paragraph style of writing, three to four lines. 
leave one line between each para. This is very important from a presentation, from a layout point of view that when you, when you start a new para or a new point, leave one empty line in between. And it's very easy to leave one line in between. Just press enter two times, right? If you just press enter two times, automatically there will be one space in between. High focus on formats. Look for stress words. When you're reading the exhibit, look for stress words like very significantly, extremely, notably. So if you see this, these stress words, Make sure that you use that sentence in your answer because this is something important, right? That is why the examiner is using the word significant or extreme competition or something like that. Use a tabular format for weakness and recommendation type question. We already discussed that yesterday and use of models is not mandatory. So don't try to forcefully use any model. Uh, if you can use a model simply, if it makes your life easy, then use it. But don't try to forcefully use a model unnecessarily. Now, this part is very interesting and important. Bouncer question. Well, can you guess what is the meaning of a bouncer question? Bouncer question means what? Any idea? Try to guess from the name. Bouncer question. So those of you who know a little bit about cricket, there's a bouncer ball, right? So that ball, the batsman is not able to figure out and he tries to just save himself and leave that ball, let it go. Bouncer question in SBL means it's a question which you have no idea. You don't know what the fuck to do with it. No common sense. Bouncer question means you have no clue what to do with it. And there is always in all your SBL paper, in each and every SBL paper, there is at least one bouncer question where you will really, really don't know what the hell is this. Maybe it is the topic is a very weird topic which you don't know. It could be Maybe there is no information provided in the exhibit. It could be that the requirement is so drafted, so complicately uh, that you are not even able to understand the requirement. Whatever is the reason, doesn't matter. It is a question where you actually don't really know what to do. Got it? There, and there is at least one bouncer question in every paper and you can clearly identify that question. <clears throat> you can clearly identify that question. What to do with a bouncer question? Normally it is somewhere in between. What to do in a bouncer question? Oh, whoa, oh, oh, who's that unmute guy? Mute. Sheriff, thank you. What to do with the bouncer question? Push it to the last. Push it to the last. Please type all of you what to do with the bouncer question. Do it in the last. Please type all of you. Do it in the end. Okay, remember this. It's not easy, but you have to be very, very uh, hard-headed. If it's a bouncer question, 
You fuck me, I fuck you back, man. Push it to the last. Right? You have to be have that anger in you. Fight back. Fight back. Push it. So if it is if it is, if the bouncer question is the last question on your task, if it's a last question, then obviously it's the last question, no problem. But if that question is somewhere in between, if that question is somewhere in between, then you will have to skip it. Leave some space and move on to the next question. Got it? If it is if it is in between, leave few lines and move to the next question. Please, guys, can you all close off your videos? All the girls are getting distracted, and all the guys are also getting distracted. Please close all your videos. Thank you. You know, in one of my previous classes, there was this girl. She was wearing wearing some very less clothes. And she didn't knew her video was on. She was not aware. So please don't take any risks. Huh? It was very awkward. She was not aware the video was on and she was in her night suit or something. Uh, so please don't take any risks. Close your videos, please. Guys, I don't want any bad comments, all right? Only I'm the one who's allowed. Thank you. Where were we? So, bouncer question, skip it if it's in between, right? Do it in the end. How will you identify a bouncer question? Normally, once you, uh, who's this with? People are having issues with Abdul Brahim. What's wrong with this guy? I've closed this video. Okay, I've closed this video. Happy? Okay. I mean, he's not listening. I mean, he's already he's gone somewhere. He's just, the screen is on. All right. Someone asked on the group, what if all the questions are bouncer? <laughs> all right. I don't know. What if all the questions are bouncer? Well, you then do all the questions in the end, or I will see you in the next attempt. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, Nikhil is saying, skip the attempt. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's right. So in QH, there was a bouncer question. In QH, there was a bouncer question. Um, it was probably that question on sound cost management and control, this one, 3A. Alhamdulillah, excuse me. 3A, draft a memo for the to send to all housing department which advises on the importance of sound management and control. So the requirement is straightforward that we have to talk about the importance of sound cost and management. But when you look at the exhibit, that exhibit is a bit crazy. Oh. You know, when you read the exhibit, it's pretty crazy. And you might find it difficult to actually link with the exhibit. So let's push it towards the end. I'm not saying skip it. I'm just saying push it towards the end. So once you have done all the rest of the questions properly, then you can give some time on this. And still, if you are not able to do it properly, then fuck it. Then 
you know, go back and uh, add some extra points um, in the other ones, right? All right, so once you do the last, do the bouncer question in the last, what is the strategy? Leave and skip the question. Attempt this question in the last. And if you want to, you know, attempt it in the last, how will you do it? Just try to define a little bit. Use search and find option on the CB platform to using keywords, summarize the current status problem from your own words. Just try to fill some space, some information. Just flirt around with it. Understood? In the last, not in the middle. Is that clear? Okay. Technical articles. So we are done with the exam techniques. Do I have any sensible question on exam techniques? I will take it now. Yes, Habiba, absolutely correct. OS, I will give break after 30 minutes. Any more exam technique related questions? Should we give the cause or consequence relating to scenario first? Yes, in almost every requirement. When you are drafting, you have to talk about the cause or the impact. Yes, Alcazander, uh, possible. All right. <clears throat> now I want to talk about technical articles and um, after the technical articles, we will give a break, okay? This technical articles will take maximum 10 to 15 minutes and then I will give a break, right? So for technical articles, since November, since last nine months, these four articles were published. Application of new technology part one, application of new technology part two, environmental and sustainability issues, it was in July, and responsible leadership in July, All right? So, this third and fourth ones were tested already in your exams. So there is very low chance of repetition. Normally they don't repeat at all. So environmental sustainability was tested in December and responsible leadership was tested in March, right? So don't worry about these, just skip these two articles, forget about it. Now, application of new technology part one and part two has not been tested. And just now I found out, just now I found out that there is another article, application of new technology part three. So there's a new article just I found out before the a webinar that there is a new article, very recent application of new technology part three. So I would actually not worry about these two because again, these two are quite old articles. If they were to be tested, they would have been tested, right? Um, so let's focus on this one, application of new technology part three, all right? <clears throat> I'll do it right now. So I'll just show you this article. It's on the ACCA website. Here, application of new technology part three. This is the third and final article on the application of new technologies. This article considers cloud computing. You see this? So this article talks about cloud computing. It talks about the benefits, 
and some technical things, models, and conclusion. So, do you want me to uh, talk about cloud computing and give you an overview so that you know what exactly it is? Do you want me? All right. Okay, all right. So let me open up my uh, notes. I already have uh, cloud computing here. What I will do is after this webinar, I will include some bullet points in your in this webinar presentation and handout. And then I will circulate so that, you know, you can go through it. All right. Because I just found it a few minutes before the webinar. I will include it and recirculate the handout. Is that all right? Okay. So first of all, what is cloud computing? Traditionally, IT activities, hardware, software, servers, blah, 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 were done locally. That is, companies used to own physical servers and software and store data and manage entire IT themselves. So first of all, do you think IT is now important for any business? All businesses are using softwares, ERPs, uh, systems, they have uh, websites, they have apps. So that's very clear that, uh, yes, Sayed Heather, I agree, um, that IT is now critical, right? So in Many years back, many years back, when the concept of cloud computing was not there, all companies had their own servers. What is a server? Server is a big computer in which all your softwares and data are stored. So each company had their own local servers. It was physically there inside the company premises and it contained all their softwares and all their data. So because of that, because they were having physical servers on their premises, A, they needed big IT technical team, right? To manage the IT infrastructure and all the servers and equipment and network and data and software. And B, it required a lot of space and C, uh, there were security risks as well, because, you know, obviously not every company has IT security expertise. So the data and uh, were exposed to hacking risks, cyber attacks, all those things. Then came cloud computing. Cloud computing is a concept where you don't need physical servers in your premises. So cloud computing providers, service providers, basically Amazon provides cloud computing services, Google provides cloud computing services, Microsoft provides cloud computing, and there are so many other renowned companies in the world who provides cloud computing. So they have very large servers in their premises. You don't need any physical server in your premises. Halas. They have huge professional commercial setups in their premises. And you can save your data, software, everything in their server. So you don't need your own physical server and data storage in your premises, you can use their servers, right? 
because they are doing it in a professional and commercial and a large scale manner they they have expertise they specialize in it they have a huge it team it technical team it security team backups disaster recovery so they are doing it professionally so instead of you doing it on your own you can use their servers you can say in layman language that you can rent out you can take their servers on rent they will charge you monthly subscription or some annual fees and you can store your data your software on their servers agreed you're basically outsourcing uh, you're using their equipment instead of using your own equipment. Is that correct? Yeah, OneDrive is Microsoft. Exactly, OneDrive. Now, I have a question. If their servers are in some other country, they are not in my premises, how the hell will I connect to their servers? Any idea? How will I connect to those servers? Internet, absolutely. Internet, that's it. Don't use, tell me sexy words, IOT and all the internet. The only way you can connect to something which is geographically away from you is internet. Yeah, VPN works on internet, my boy or my baby, right? Internet, VPN works on internet, right? VPN is just a added security tool for internet connection, right? Okay, so now does it mean that we are highly dependent on internet if we want to connect with the server? What will happen if the internet connectivity is down? You will, have, you will not have access to the data. So you actually need real time 24 seven access. And for that you need internet, right? <clears throat> now let me give some real examples. Do you have any email? Your, do you have your own email on Gmail or something? Okay. Where are you saving those emails? Is it in your laptop? Any server? Or it's on the cloud? It's in the cloud. It's not on your local machine. All your Gmail is on the cloud. Cloud means a third party provider somewhere else. So how do you connect with your Gmail? So you can connect from any device. You can connect your emails through your phone. You can connect your emails through your laptop. Can you connect to your emails to your friend's laptop or from a cyber cafe? Yeah, because the data is not stored in the local machine. It is out there somewhere in the cloud. It doesn't matter which laptop you are using, whose laptop you are using, as long as you have internet, you can connect to your cloud and access your mails. That's cloud. So all emails are on cloud and that's for so many years. It's just that we didn't knew what it is called. What is it called now? It's cloud computing. Now talk about Facebook, Insta. Where are they stored? Facebook, Insta, they're also on cloud because you can connect from any laptop, your friend laptop, your cyber cafe, from your office machine, through internet, you just put in your login ID and password and OTP and you'll get connected. So even Facebook, Twitter, 
Insta, all these things are on cloud. You, you are doing it for so many years, but you didn't know what it's called, right? Now, talk about your Pfizer. Can you please turn off your camera? Talk about your cell phone. Talk about your cell phone. So you have, even your WhatsApp is on cloud, right? So your cell phone, you have contacts, like you have all your names and numbers are there. So when you change your mobile phone, are the numbers lost? No, because it's all there on the cloud. You see, so cloud technology is now like 10, at least 10, 15 years old. Similarly, I'll now talk, give example of my company. We don't have any local servers at all. So we have a ERP. We have a proper ERP system in which there's a lot of customer data, financial data, HR data, uh, attendance records, everything is on the ERP because it's all IT now. So we have a full-fledged ERP. We have a website. We have some apps for customers. ERP are softwares like SAP, Oracle Financials, like business softwares in which you do all your transactions. All your data is in the ERP, Tally, QuickBooks, anything. So we have ERP, which contains 100% AWS, 100% of our data, all kinds of data, customer, supplier, employees, everything is there. We have websites, we have apps, but we don't have it. We don't have a local server. Everything is on our cloud provider servers. Okay, so I think uh, we are using uh, Amazon. We are using Amazon. And for backup purposes, we are using Google. So the main data is on Amazon cloud. We are paying for it monthly. And the backup, we are saying that we need a backup with another cloud provider. So the backup is being mirrored or taken on Google Cloud. So we are paying Google as well. Got it? It's not expensive.
clouds all these erp are on cloud models web based models now so now we so now when we want to connect we need 24/7 internet if the internet is down we are screwed because everything gets stuck all right but now if i'm traveling let's say when i'm traveling and something goes wrong with my laptop what will i do if i'm traveling and my laptop gets stolen i can log in from the any other person's laptop i can the, i can use the pc in the hotel in which i am staying i will just use my user id password vpn all those security things and i will access my data yes what if the internet is not there you will be screwed you will be screwed right so now you understand the whole concept of cloud computing your entire it data software is sitting geographically miles apart in someone else's server and you will access them or connect them through internet now can you guys tell me the let's talk about some advantages and disadvantages slash risk can you give me three advantages of this thing for from a company's point of view so for my company what are the advantages of going to a cloud it's cost effective think of three advantages which companies can avail by using cloud model why did we use cloud model easy right you can think of three four advantages i'm just going through your comments all of them are absolutely correct all right so let's go through my list flexibility that is staff can access from anywhere the geographical location of the staff doesn't matter if i'm working from home this concept is now very famous right especially after pandemic people are working from home i work work i work from home at least one day in a week doesn't matter if i'm working from home if i'm using my own personal laptop from home i can still connect so it's a lot of flexibility geographical i don't have to go to office to access my systems as long as i have internet i can connect from anywhere from any machine right high level of storage capacity yes so you know those those guys google amazon have huge servers we can't afford large expensive servers so but you know if though they have a lot of space so you know i can there is i can store a lot of data there is no limitation high technical standards like higher security backups because those guys are doing it professionally commercially they are employing uh, the best in the world best security experts best technical experts they are following protocols backup so you know i automatically have access to higher technical standards i might not have been able to if i ne i needed to do it locally then i would have to hire so many it people right it eliminates heavy investment in it equipment yes i don't need to buy servers i don't need it equipments the servers and all those things significant cost savings in it operations yes i don't need a huge it team i don't need a uh, space for servers i don't need space for it department everything is outsourced 
and small firms can benefit a lot as they cannot afford to invest in huge IT infrastructure and all those things. So I think these are very important and relevant benefits of cloud computing, especially for small and medium sized organizations. It is very, very practical for them because they don't have to invest in heavy IT equipments. They don't need large IT teams. They don't need so much space for these things. They don't need IT security people. Everything is outsourced to the cloud provider. Any questions on advantages? Is it simple, clear? But you will need to memorize this. Huh? I think I'm pretty sure there will be a question on cloud computing this time. I'm pretty sure there will be a question on cloud computing and uh, they will ask you about advantages or disadvantages. They might ask you to evaluate whether the company should go for cloud computing or not. So you will need to talk about the pros and the cons. So you will need to remember this. Now, do you think, do you think there are some limitations or risks associated with cloud computing? Please make, give me three disadvantages or High initial cost, who the fuck is this? Chrissy, my girl, what's wrong with you? That's the advantage that there is no investment. Think from the company's point of view, the organization's point of view. What are the risks for us if we go for cloud computing? I'm just going through the list. Yeah, absolutely correct. Done. Chrissy, you are clear, right? Okay, let's go through my list. You see, there are so many disadvantages as well. So there are advantages, but I can see there are so many disadvantages as well. So what are the disadvantages? High reliance on internet connectivity. That's the first and foremost there is a high reliance on internet connectivity. So we need to address that risk. So in my company, we have, uh, so luckily we are in Dubai. So Dubai has, uh, there is no power breakdowns. Everything is streamlined and disciplined, but yet we have internet connections from two different providers. We have taken internet connections from two different internet providers. One is Etisalat, one is Do. We are primarily using Etisalat, but in case something goes wrong with Etisalat, and it can, it is possible that Etisalat might screw up, there is some technical issue with their system. So we immediately jump to the next internet providers. That's how we manage this risk. But sometimes, you know, uh, there is a country disconnectivity. So the entire country is out of internet, then you are screwed. Okay, so that's the biggest disadvantage or risk. And then what about this? High reliance on cloud provider. How do I trust Google? What if they fuck up? What if their system goes down? So I have internet, but they are having fuck ups on their side. What if there's a fire or a bomb blast at their premises? You see? So there are two high dependencies. One is on the internet, and then you're also dependent on the cloud provider because you're outsourcing, right? So how did we manage? Number one, we selected globally renowned companies. Like we did not went with smaller, unknown, uh, doubtful cloud providers. We made a list of who are the best in the world. They are a little bit expensive, but you cannot take risks, right? So we went with Amazon and Google. 
And as I said, that we are taking, we are using Amazon Cloud, but we are taking full backup on Google. So if something goes wrong with Amazon Cloud Provider, we can immediately switch to Google. That's how you minimize the risk, right? And then you basically lose direct control. So you, because you are dependent on the cloud provider, you lose direct control. Cloud provider has access to all your data. Absolutely, yes. Because you are saving everything on their premises, their servers. If they want, they have full access to your data. For example, Facebook, they have access to you. WhatsApp, they have access to you. If you want, if they want to check or investigate, they can easily see what the hell you are up to. Then there are some regulatory requirements for privacy of data. So even there are some regulations now. There are a lot of countries where there are some regulations of what you can outsource, what you cannot outsource, especially depending on personal data, privacy of data, credit card numbers, you know, medical records. So we will have to follow that. We should not uh, violate uh, any rules or legal requirements relating to data computing, especially relating to private personal data. And high risk of hacking as cloud providers are main targets for hackers. So yes, although they have high security, but cloud providers are gold mine. They have so much data of so many companies. So hackers, they actually target um, the cloud providers because it's a gold mine for them. Understood? So you need to memorize all these advantages and all these disadvantages or risks. That's it. So on this one page, this is just one slide. I explained what is the meaning of cloud computing and then we spoke about the advantages and we spoke about the disadvantages. And I think from your exam point of view, uh, this is more than enough. If you go through the articles, uh, they are talking something about the technical infrastructure and models. That's bullshit. Nobody will test you on the technical uh, specs or you know information about cloud. From a business point of view, you just need to know what cloud computing is and what are the advantages and disadvantages so that if you're asked to evaluate the pros and cons, you can talk about these things and link with the scenario. Yes, so you don't need to read the article now. It's done, I've done it for you, right? Just memorize this slide, five advantages, five disadvantages, and boom, you are done. There is no way to identify technical articles, only I can identify because I know which are the old ones and new ones. You will not be able to do that, so don't worry about it. So now let's coming back, let me summarize. I think from your exam point of view, what, what are the articles you should read? Just take a quick look at this one, part one, this one, which is part two, and most importantly, this one, part three. Part one and two, in my opinion, is least important, but this part three is more important. So if you want to go through the part one and part two of the article, I have already covered it in my December webinar on, way, on day two. So just quickly go through it. It's pretty easy. It's pretty easy. Even if you go through this handout, you will understand. Okay. Uh, environmentally sustainability, forget about it because it has already been tested in December attempt. Responsible leadership, forget about it because it has already tested in March attempt. Okay. That's it. So just focus on part one, part two, and part three with a high focus on part three, this one, and very less focus on this one. Okay.
less focus and high focus on part three. Any questions on technical articles? Are we all clear? All my December webinars are available. If, if it's not, message me. I will have it checked out. But all my previous webinars is available on the Wi-Fi channel. Okay, you can just Google it there. So many people have copy pasted and made their own channel. So just Google on YouTube and you'll find it. Come on, man. Then just Google. You will find other people have copied my webinar and they have put it in on their channel to monetize it. I'm okay with that. All right. Let's take a 15 minute break. Or uh, 15 minute break. Okay. And then we will move, we will start drafting. We will solve one more question today. 15 minute break. It is what time here? It is 7.56. Uh, let's say eight. Let's say 8.56. So let's say uh, make it 19 minute break. You can say your praise. So 8.56 to 9.15, Paki time, huh? I will see you in approximately 20 minutes. So please be here on time. Excellent. So I was just checking whether my December 2022 webinar is there or not. It's not there. So I will have it fixed uh, tomorrow. Don't worry. It will be available tomorrow uh, afternoon or evening, okay? All right, so, so now we are about to start our drafting. We will do one more question today. And before that, I'll just make a small announcement that uh, my revision Practice class, which is a paid session, will be starting from 9th of May. We will solve five full case studies in a live class like we will do right now. We will do three mock exams. I will check one mock and all classes will be recorded. And uh, there will be a grand revision. And this is the cost or investment. And if you're interested in joining, you can please message on this number, okay? Right. This is a schedule of the revision classes. So you can see it's a jam-packed thing. It is from 7 p.m. Pakistan time to 10.30 p.m. Pakistan time, okay? So today's practice topic is basically Harmon's process strategy matrix. And then we will do a question on customer service process strategy matrix from your latest paper, which is QH, question number 5B, right? So, First, let's read the question. So this is paper September, December 2022 on your CBE platform. I'll click on task number five and we will be, five, we will be doing 5A. Can you please read from here till here? That's it. Or maybe the entire question. Please read the entire question. You have one minute. All right, so what's the background? That you know the board is concerned that the failure in customer service delivery in recent years and the publicity that is generating are damaging its competitive position. So you see their customer service is deteriorating. It is creating a bad uh, publicity, negative 
reputation and now it is affecting their competitive positions which means that customers are now uh, moving or switching to other competitors and the chief operating officer has been asked with the review uh, uh, to review and redesign the customer service process. You have been asked by the COO to prepare a briefing note which applies an, an appropriate process strategy matrix to explain how QH could improve its customer service. Seven marks. Then part B says advise on the key roles and responsibilities as a project sponsor, seven marks. And there is professional skills to demonstrate communication skills. How, what is the guidance? In explaining concisely and effectively an appropriate process strategy matrix and the role and responsibilities of the project sponsor to the COO. You have to communicate properly, effectively about the processes of customer service and what are the roles, two marks, okay? First of all, if you look at the, if you look at the professional marks, these two parts do not have their own professional skills. The professional skills is mentioned in the end, which basically covers both of them, right? It talks about process strategy metrics, as well as the role and responsibility. So it's a combined professional skills. Should we allocate these two marks to each of them, one each? Is that okay? So we need to allocate the professional marks between these two because this professional skills is a combined thing for part A and B. So let's allocate one mark to part A and one mark to part B. So now what are the total marks for part A? This becomes eight marks, including professional skills. And this one also becomes eight marks, including professional skills, total 16 marks, correct? Is that clear? Now for eight marks, how many points are you supposed to talk? Four points. Four points are four paragraphs, all right? How many minutes we have for eight marks? 16 minutes, yes. Two multiplied by eight is 16. Very good, very good. What is the format required? Format, it's a briefing paper here. Now this, now the, I have a question. This briefing paper, is it for part A or part B or both? I think it looks like a combined briefing paper which should include A and B both, right? Okay, so let's first quickly make the skeleton first as per our, our technique. Let's draw the skeleton. We are doing question number five, five A and five B, right? So please make the format, it is, all right, so very simple, the heading briefing paper to COO from senior finance manager, that is our role which we read yesterday. Subject is, you know, I covered both the parts, customer service and project sponsor date as uh, September 20X2, which was mentioned in the overview, which we read yesterday, introduction, this briefing paper, and I just copy pasted both the requirements together. Closure, best regards, senior finance manager, right? Now there are two 
requirements which we which we have to cover in the briefing paper right what is the first one it is a process strategy slash customer service correct or just say customer service if you don't want to confuse what's the other heading role and of project sponsor is this clear So these will be two broad headings so that the examiner can clearly see that you have covered both the technical requirements in one briefing paper. Chrissy, that's fine. Okay, got it guys. The skeleton is now ready. Now, before we talk about process strategy metrics, it's a model. I want to tell you first that it is the first time that the examiner has mentioned a model name in the requirement. Okay, apply an appropriate process strategy matrix. This is the first time in three years that the examiner has mentioned a model. Before that, he has never ever mentioned any model, right? So this means that we should be aware of some basic models and I will share the list with you after this question, okay? But, is the, C, is the COO, is he interested in the model or is he interested in the changes required to improve the process? What do you think? Is the CEO really interested in a model or he wants you to talk about what changes should we bring to the customer service process in order to improve it? Put yourself in COO shoes. He's not here to learn a model from you, right? He's probably more interested. So yes, we will touch upon process strategy matrix model just because the examiner has specifically named it. But I would actually then focus more on what suggestions or recommendations, what we need to do to fix the problems, right? Is this clear? So this question is not about a model, although you will need to refer or touch base on that, but actually the bulk of your answer will not be educating or training him the model. The bulk of the answer will actually be the recommendations, what needs to be done. Do you understand this concept? This is what SBL is about. The actual, when you put yourself in the COO shoes, he will be more interested in the changes, right? So let's quickly go through the model. So I'll just explain what the model is. So a process strategy matrix is a matrix. It's a four box matrix, which simply helps us to identify which processes are more important, which processes are less important. You see, there are hundreds and hundreds of processes in an organization, right? There are so many processes. Finance has so many processes. Marketing has so many processes. IT has so many. Every department has several processes, but not of them are, all of them are not equally important. Some of them are more important or critical processes, some of them are less important processes, right? So this model helps us to identify which processes are more important and which processes are less important. Understood? How do we decide which processes are more important, which are less important? So you look at the x-axis. 
So based on the strategic importance or the impact of the process versus the process complexity, whether the process is simple or complex. So let's focus more on what is the meaning of the strategic importance of a project. Strategic importance of a project means that the project, you know, has, the process has significant impact if it goes wrong. You know, some process, if they goes wrong, it will not have a significant impact or consequence. Huh? We can manage it. But if any process, if that process goes wrong, if it has a significant impact on the business, then that's a high strategic process. For example, if a process directly affects my customers, if a process directly affect my customers, is it a high importance or a low importance? High, because any process which directly affects my customers, if that process is crude, what will happen? Tell me, if any process if which directly affects my customers and if it is crude, what will happen? We will lose customers, right? And if we lose customers, we will lose revenues, we will lose market share, we will lose our competitive position, um, reputational risk, negative publicity, and in the worst case scenario, it's a business risk or a going concern. <laughs> right? Now, compare this with another process. Let's say the attendance, employee attendance process employee attendance process, right? If that is crude, will it have a significant business impact? No, it will have a low impact, right? It's an internal thing. We will not lose customers or market share because our atten employee attendance process is problematic, right? It's, it's got a low internal impact maybe your efficiency or something might be affected, but not a significant business impact. But if it's a customer service process, then it has got serious implications, right? So now, will you be able to judge which processes are high important versus less important? Just think in terms of business impact. If the screw up, can result in loss of customers, loss of revenue, business risk, then it's a serious process. And if it's internal, it's smaller, then it's a low importance, clear? Similarly, process complexity. Some processes are simple and straightforward and some processes are complicated. It depends on the process, right? Not all of them are equal. Some are easy, some are mid-range, some are complicated. For easy ones, you don't, re you don't require specialists or experts, but for complicated processes, you need proper trained experts, right? Got it? Okay. Now, the rule of thumb is those processes which are low importance, generally they are outsourced. Processes which are of low business importance, they are outsourced. Processes which have high business importance are insourced. Like insourced means we do it ourselves. We should not outsource something which is really important. Important things we should do ourselves. Less important things like office cleaning, photocopying, this and that, outsource it. Got it? So this is a high level introduction about the process strategy matrix. The strategy is very simple. Something which is important, we have to do. Something which is less important, 
outsource. That's the process strategy matrix. Yes, um, uh, cloud computing is an exception. I completely agree. Cloud computing is an exception. Sometimes there are exceptions. Now, come back to the scenario. Which process are we talking about? Come back to the scenario. Which processes are we talking about? Customer service. Is it an important process? I know it's important, but how can we link with this scenario? How can you explain to the CEO why this is an important process? Can you copy paste? Can you identify some sentence from the scenario or the exhibit to prove it to me? I want a sentence from the exhibit through which you can prove that it's an important process. Copy paste. From where you can pick. That's how you link with the scenario. Yes, overview. So let's read the background. Read the two lines of the background, the first two lines of the background. Keshav, I am asking, please give me a sentence from the exhibit. Please read the background of this. It is, is damage, is, it is damaging our competitive position, right? Don't you think if we tell the CEO that customer service was a very important process because it directly affects our competitive position? So the examiner doesn't like general philosophical answer like customer service is important because we will lose customers, we will lose revenue, blah, 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 blah. That's a general philosophical answer. How the hell will you link with this scenario? You are a senior finance manager of this company and you're talking to the CEO. You will tell him that by this is affecting our competitive position. Use words from the exhibits. This is what you need to learn. Also, if you remember from yesterday in the overview, I had identified this. Can you see increasing levels of negative publicity and customer complaints have resulted in declining financial performance over the last two years? Yes. Also look at exhibit three. Remember there was some graph. Can you identify any graph relating to customer complaint or customer service? Look at this customer satisfaction has been constantly declining since last four years. This is how you explain to the COO that, you know, customer service is a high a strategic importance process. Why? Because it is leading to a decline in our financial performance. It is affecting our competitive position. As you can see, customer satisfaction score has been continuously falling since last four years. You have to talk logic when you're talking to the CEO, COO, you cannot be general or philosophical. You have to talk in the context of our company our company understood okay so this will be one point huh we will uh, we will say that we can use 
process strategy matrix to improve our customer service as per this matrix we have to uh, decide we have to analyze whether the process or let me say based on strategic importance and complexity of the process so i just explained to him just because the question is telling me to use matrix that is why i am you know just talking briefly about the model otherwise uh, if the question was silent if it did not talk about the model i could have avoided this and directly started my answer got it so we can use process strategy matrix to improve our customer service based on strategic importance and complexity the x axis and the y axis now i will see that our customer service process is of high strategic importance why because it is leading to a decline because it is leading to negative publicity decline in our financial performance for last two years and there's something mentioned here as well right in the background uh damaging our competitive position and damaging our competitive position so that so in this first paragraph in light of this model i proved to the ceo that this is a high importance process why because it is leading to negative publicity it is leading to a decline in our financial performance since last two years and damaging our competitive position done finished first point is over the whole purpose of this paragraph was to prove that it is a high strategic importance process i will move to the exhibit which exhibit are we supposed to read uh, exhibit 8 i had already marked in the start exhibit 8 okay let's open exhibit 8 can you guys please read this exhibit and then we will see what recommendations can we suggest to improve the process i give you 5 minutes once you are done please type done 5 minute to use this to read this exhibit so the, i remember one thing i just remember is it is customer providing customer service part of our strategic objectives any idea do you remember uh, the four strategic objectives which was mentioned in the annual report maintaining financial strength providing quality houses and customer service you see provide high level of customer service so it is part of our four strategic objectives so if you want to score a bit more if you want to score a bit more i can also add this more sentence one more sentence here to link with the objective also providing good customer service is one of our 
strategic objectives. You see, the examiner really loves when you pick stuff from here and there, link with the objectives, uh, business impact, all these things, right? So I just added this extra sentence um, just to score some extra mark that I'm linking with the objectives as well. So now I think the COO will be convinced that yes, it is an important process because it's a, a one of our strategic objectives. And then it has got, uh, it's resulting in bad financials, bad reputation, loss, loss of competitive position. So this paragraph will convince him that it is a very critical process. Now, now coming back to the exhibit, were you able to, what is the problem? What issues the customers, what are they complaining about? What are their complaints? Did you understand? So one customer said this, one customer said this, one customer said this. So what is their problem? Let's try to fix it. Can you read the first one? Let me read the first one. One customer is saying the website is quite useful to find out about the house buying process in general, but I need to speak to someone about my specific issues. I'm buying a very expensive executive home and I don't think it's too much to expect to speak to someone before I spend. So what does he want? What does he want? He wants to speak to someone. He, keep it simple, guys. What does he want? He wants to speak with someone. Correct? So why is he not able to speak with someone? Any idea? Maybe there is no contact details on the website. Why is he not able to speak with someone? What's so complicated? So I'm assuming that there is no contact details because if there were any contact details, he, he could have picked up the phone and spoke, right? So if you want to speak with ACCA, if you want to speak with ACCA, how will you contact them? You will email them. Where will you get the email ID from? It's on their website. Okay, can you call them if you want to speak with someone? Someone is saying there's a toll free number. Let me check. I don't trust you guys. You remember skepticism? This number is there. Send a message. Number. They've given their global offices, regional offices. Yeah. And if I Google, I can also see some data for Dubai as well. So what are the general ways of contacting? So we, what we should provide on our website? What should we provide on our website? Should we provide uh, in, in email uh, ID for inquiries? We should provide contact, contact numbers and email IDs. How about a live chat? So many organizations, they have a live chat option as well. That, you know, if I want to ask something, I will start chatting and there'll be someone, maybe an AI bot or a person, I can chat as well. So that is also an option. Some organizations also have a callback option. You know what is a callback option? What is it? 
that you leave your number and someone from the company will call you. Callback option is that if I want to speak with someone, I just leave my number and then some representative of the company will call me back. There are so many ways you can talk, right? There are so many ways you can talk and this poor customer is saying what? This poor customer is saying, I need to speak with someone, but you know, I don't know whom to, uh, how to contact. It's so basic, right? Don't you think the customer will be frustrated? Okay, so what do you recommend? Please type your recommendation as one sentence. We can recommend so many things, right? No, Isabella, that's, I don't want philosophical answer, like enhance the website, bullshit. Be specific. Training, fuck you, man. So bad, I'm so pissed off. More labor should be hired. My God, Wes, I'm so disappointed. Why the fuck you guys are complicating the answer? Outsourced to a call center? Oh my God. How the customer will know how to contact the call center? I don't know why you guys complicate answers. That is why you struggle with SBL. Keep it simple and basic. Is this complicated? It is very basic, right? That the customer wants to speak. He doesn't know where to call, whom to speak to. So I'm just saying include contact details on the website. Halas. What do I mean by contact details? I said you can include a telephone number. You can give an email ID. And if you want to improve it further, we can also have live chat options or callback facilities or whatever. That's it. I don't know why people were saying hire more labor, outsource, they stick to the basic, stick the problem, fix the problem. If there is no contact details, bloody hell, provide contact details, that's it. That's it. You have 16 minutes to draft all this. So how can you write more? You cannot write a lot more, right? Just stick to the basic so that you can give a simple to the point answer. Chrissy, we don't know that. We don't know whether there's a staff shortage. Even if we add staff, the customer doesn't know where to call. You understand, we first we have to give numbers, right? First, you have to dis display the contact details. That's the first thing. Yes, OS. Okay, got it guys. Can I move on to the next one? What's the other guy saying? The FAQs on the websites are not enough to answer my specific query. What is FAQs? What is FAQs? Frequently asked questions. What is the purpose of FAQs? Why do organizations have FAQs on their website? So that most of the common questions, the customer can easily look at the answers, right? The purpose of FAQ is to cover most of the most common general questions, right? So that he doesn't waste time all the possible questions we can think of should be there in FAQs.
So if the customer is saying that FAQs are not enough, what should we do now? If the customer is saying FAQs are not enough, what should we do? We need to add more FAQs, right? We should provide adequate FAQs. We should analyze. Yes, we should review our FAQs. We should identify what's missing. And then we should add more question to FAQ so that majority of the customers find the answer easily, right? Simple. If the accused, uh, FAQs are not answering his questions, then let's add, let's try to find out what are those missing questions and add them to the FAQ. That's it. Can you write this in simple words? The existing FAQs are not sufficient. This is a statement of fact. We should analyze which questions are missing and then add those questions in our FAQs. Why? So that it covers majority of the questions which any customer can ask. That's it. Plain and simple English. Easy peasy. Yes, Akshi, you can. You know, it's important to understand the approach. The answers will vary a little bit, right? Not necessarily you will write the same wording, but understand the approach. Look at the problem and just give a simple solution because in under exam conditions, you cannot write lengthy stories, right? So if the FAQs are insufficient, add more FAQs, khalas. If there is no contact details, Provide more contact details, khalas. Learn the attitude and the approach to your answer. Okay, let's read the third one. I needed to speak to customer services about the delays to my new house. So there were some delays. So he wanted to speak about the delays, but when I rang customer service, I was continually put through to the wrong department. What? The people on the other end of the phone just did not seem to understand my problem. So if he wants to speak about the delays, why was he continuously put to the wrong department? Why his call was transferred to the wrong department? For example, you are an ACCA student. If you want to talk about your exam booking, and you are transferred to some wrong department, they don't know what to, how to solve your problem, then they transferred you to another person. He is not the relevant person and you are going round and round, you'll be frustrated, right? So how can we fix it? Why people don't know where to transfer? Very good IVR system. Huh? What is IVR system? Don't mention call centers. Yeah, call centers doesn't fix these problems. What is an IVR system? Someone mentioned IVR system. I know what IVR is. I think I know. So have anyone of you made a call to a bank? Ah, IVR is interactive voice response. So when you dial to a bank, do you, do you get an automated uh, message that if you want to talk, if you want to open an account, dial one. If you want to uh, open a credit card, dial two. If you want to eat burger, dial three. If you want to go to washroom, dial four, right? Even for ACCA, you get this? Interesting. So when you dial, if you want to open a credit card, then you dial two, then the call is automatically transferred to the concerned department, right? So for example, in ACCA, if you want to talk about exam, you will dial that, that number and you will be automatically transferred 
to uh, the concerned person, right? So you can automate this. You can automate this very easily that if some customer is, wants to ask about delays, he can dial four. If there's a new inquiry, he can dial one. If there's a complaint, dial nine. Okay. So this is automation, but what if you don't want to automate then, if I don't automate, then probably I need to train my operator, right? I need to train my staff. I need to train my telephone operators that when they receive a call, they need to listen to them, what they want, and then they know exactly where to transfer or who to transfer the call. So I think there are two solutions here. There are two solutions I can think of. Number one is training. That we need to train our people that which department can deal with which kind of calls. And secondly, we can also automate using uh, the IVR system or what, what, whatever it is called, interactive voice recognition. Do you remember this global prize winner, what he said yesterday that he said that, you know, I think of real life examples. Remember? He said a couple of times that, you know, he thinks when he gets stuck, he thinks of real life examples. So why the fuck you guys can't think of real life examples? Put yourself in customer's shoes and think that if I want to, if I'm calling ACCA, what's happening? Automatic messages. And sometimes when I dial a bank, there's also an option of talk to an agent. So when I dial zero, then I can speak with someone, right? So that person needs to be trained to handle my query. Got it? So let me draft it for you quickly. One last point. Is this plain and simple guys? Can you please read? I'm writing to the COO, so I just need to be plain, simple, and clear. Some customers complain that they were just correcting some English, continually put through to the wrong department. We will have to train our staff so that they transfer the call to the correct department. Also, we can automate our telephone system so that the customer can directly connect to the concerned department according to his requirement. Alas. So whatever you can think from a practical point of view, which can solve this problem in our company, just give that recommendation. Your answers might vary with mine, that's fine. But as long as it is practical and relevant to this company, you will get marks. So how many points I've given so far? I talked about high strategic importance. Then I talked about, you know, contact us, FAQs, training. Already I have four points. Yes, Vivek. Nico, you can skip that. No need. Okay. How many points were we supposed to write for eight marks? So I think we have four distinct paragraph, one, two, three, and four, that's about it. So I will now go to the complete second one, role and responsibilities of a project manager, or sorry, project sponsor. We are not doing this part right, right now. And then the closure, that's about it. So if something is of high strategic importance that it should be, then it should be in source. Yes, Neetu. 
right guys so this is enough for eight marks the format is there introduction is there then customer service was the first part i gave four points then i will give like four points for the role and responsibilities of a project sponsor and boom closure OS, we are not discussing flaws. It is just part of your opening sentence, right? That you first identify the problem, what is the problem, and then you give solution. Why, do, it's not part of KPIs. Where did you, where, someone is saying this is, we, we are supposed to talk about KPIs. Read the requirement carefully how they can improve the process where do you see the word kpi does it tell you to provide kpis there is no mention of kpis in the requirement there is no mention of kpis in the exhibit it just says how you can improve the ceo wants to know how we can improve so boom 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 these are the three things you need to fix immediately tell us why do you complicate requirements Okay, let's quickly talk about part B, advice on the key role and responsibility of a project sponsor. So what is the role of a project sponsor? I think I did it in my regular batch, right? So my students of my regular batch will know. What is the role of a project sponsor? Yes, his role is to provide leadership to the project he is responsible for the project accountable for the project what is his role uh, sorry responsibility what is his responsibility his job is to make sure to get the pro to get the project approved by the board to make sure to put together a project manager and a project team to make sure that the project is on track, to make sure that the project completes on time, to make sure that the project achieve its objectives, provide direction, problem solving, communication to the board, so many things. Monitor the project, yes. How many points you require for this part? So we can talk about the role and then we can give two or three responsibilities, communication, problem solving, making sure the project completes on time. It was very high scoring, easy thing. <laughs> yes, correct. Now, how do you link with this scenario? Because there is no direct exhibit here. There is no direct exhibit here, right? How do you link with the scenario? I don't want direct general answers. Use the name of the company. So what is the project about? What is this project about? Yeah, exactly. Refer to customer service in your answer. So what should be the objective of this project? What should be the objective of the project? Why we are doing this project for this project? To improve customer service, yeah. So just because there is no direct exhibit, you can just in your answer, instead of giving general answer, you can try and link with this specific project that you know the CEO needs to provide leadership to the customer service improvement project. Hmm? The customer needs to, uh, the CEO need you will or you will need to uh, get the customer service appro approval 
uh, the approval from the board for the customer service project. You will need to put together a project manager and project team and arrange resources for the customer service project. You will need to make sure that this pro project is progressing on time. You have to make sure that the objectives of the customer service improvement project is achieved. That's how. Is this a bouncer question? Are you crazy? If this is a bouncer question, God helps you. I think it was a high scoring question, role and responsibilities of project sponsor. And just, you know, repeat the name of the company, the name of the project somewhere in your answers and that's it. Guys, did you understand the approach? What I'm trying to teach you is the approach, how you format, how you draft, how you decide number of points, how you link with the scenario, how you pick up some opening sentence on the scenario and think logically. Do you think the COO will be happy to see this report? Yes, this is exactly what he wants. The CEO wants to understand his role and his responsibility as a project sponsor. So we'll tell him, bum, 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 this is your role and responsibility. Learn the approach. Okay, so for my regular students, we will be doing these, like we will be doing five full case studies in a life class like this, so that you become better and better, right? So this is the, that is why I think the revision classes is very important. So those of you who are undecided, please, can you feel the benefit of these kind of sessions so that you can understand and practice the approach? Right, guys. So let me go back to. Okay, now I, let me summarize now. We are towards the end of the webinar. Already we are overrunning the time. So let me just summarize. So you just have like four or five weeks left. So from a theoretical point of view, you need to learn these models. These are top 10 models. Huh? In my view, you should be familiar with these 10 models. Okay, one is Pestel, Water 5, SFA, SWOT toes, Corporate Parenting and Soft Growth Matrix. Harmon, stakeholder matrix, this was also tested, cultural web, context of change and risk mitigation processes. You can watch my top 25 important topic videos from YouTube, it covers all these models, right? But you have to be familiar with these 10 models, okay? Other than the models, these are 15 important topics which you should be aware, like financial ratios and projection, funding strategies, budgets, project management, like we did a question on project sponsor right now, right? Value chain, e-business, e-marketing, big data, CRM, IT and cyber risks, professional code of conduct, NEDs, committees, family owned, integrated reporting, social and environmental footprints, risk management and recommendations, control weakness, audit committee, internal audit. And I would also add cloud computing to this list because there is a recent article on that. Again, where can you watch these? You can um, um, watch my top 25 video on YouTube, all right? So you, this is the minimum you should be aware, okay? There is no compromise on the top 25 topics, which is 10 models and 15 topics, right? 
okay exam techniques just this is a recap of the exam technique which we just discussed uh, today at the start of the webinar so i'm not going to repeat it these are the list of formats which you must be very very hands on okay these are the list of professional skills which you should be very very hands on we discussed this yesterday in detail. And then there are some issues with the CVE software. Sometimes the copy pasting function does not work from the mouse. Sometimes the copy paste function does, when you use a mouse, sometimes it doesn't work in your CVE platform in the real exam. So the alternative solution is you can use control C and control V understood. And sometimes during the exam, the software can hang or some features might not work like highlighter, just refresh the browser and it will resume. Then this one is very common software automatically closes 10, 15 minutes before the time. In that case, if this happens with you, please apply for mitigation circumstances through your My ACCA portal. You can launch a complaint that my software closed 15 minutes before the time. And the real, the actual CBE software in the real exam is slightly different from the CBE practice platform. Some minor differences, not a big deal. All right. Okay, so now this is very important for those students who are planning self-study. Hmm? This is a list, a study plan for those students who are self-studying. You have approximately four weeks. So you must start by watching the top 25 videos and read the top 25 handout. Both of them are available publicly. This will, and watch as much webinars as you can. This will cover your theoretical side, and then you will have to practice these questions on your own, all right? And once you've practiced these questions on your own on the CBE platform, then you must attempt three mocks under strict exam conditions. Four hours, you must do your own mocks properly four hours. Then you will be ready for the paper. This is a plan for self-study students. For my paid students, I will be doing all this with you in the revision class starting from day after tomorrow so you don't need to do anything on your own this is for my paid students i will be coordinating all these things in the live classes with you but for self-study students you have to do it on your own so i've given you a study plan this is the exact study plan which i will follow with my paid students as well the only difference is i will be there live discussing and all those things and you will be on your own Okay, but please follow this study plan. This is very important. At the last moment, please, please stay away from books and revision kits. Why? Number one, 50% of the paper is common sense. You, by now, I think you have got a very good idea that the whole paper is scenario based. You have to apply your knowledge. So there's no point in wasting time on books. Instead of books, you can watch my top 25. Secondly, the reason why I'm saying stay away from book is you don't have sufficient time. Only four weeks is left. You must spend 80% of your time on practicing rather than, uh, you know, reading the book. Instead of book, just you know attend the live classes if you're a paid student use my simplified notes and practice sblk studies watch the webinars 
everything is available in my Google Drive. Okay. So I have a Google Drive. You can easily, um, all the material which is publicly available is there on the Google Drive. Understood? How many hours? Just hold on, let me complete my presentation and then I will take questions, right? <laughs> now, this is a very important slide. You know, all my high scoring students, all those students who score 74, 75 marks, I talked to them and all of them said that they applied this technique. All my high scoring students, they apply this technique. What is this technique? When you are doing SBL, just think that you are a CFO. Just think that you are a finance manager. Put yourself in the shoes of the CFO or the finance manager. Put yourself in the shoes. Don't think like a student. When you emit, when you put yourself in the in, in the role in the CFO shoes and also put yourself in the in the addressee role, then automatically your logical brain will start working and you will be able to give logical relevant points. The moment you start thinking like a CFO, you will be a CFO, right? So better start practicing it now. It's all about mindset. Think that you are the leader. You are a leader. You sit on the board. What will you do if you were in that problem? How will you fix it? And automatically things will start coming to your mind. But the moment you think that you are a student and you are a bookish student and you are thinking of models, you will get stuck. So get out of the student mindset. Elevate your confidence. Think like a CFO and think that you are talking to the board. How will you explain something to the board? You have to give logic. You have to be practical. You have to be um, linked with the company and the scenario, right? So just when you start imagining these things, that's a mindset. Automatically, SBL will become easy because 50% of the questions are common sense. No theoretical knowledge is required, right? Right, so again, we, I already talked about my upcoming revision classes. That's the schedule, that's the contact details. Ah, contact details, right? Remember the QH, they don't have contact details, idiots. All right, so that's about it, guys. I'm done with my side of talking. I hope you found all this yesterday and today a useful and a helpful session and i hope that you are now able to understand what sbl is about how to tackle a question how to draft a question i hope i was able to teach you all this okay now i will take some questions Daniel, I just mentioned how many questions you need to practice. I gave you a study plan. So why do you ask such questions? Just follow the study plan. Yes, Vivek. Pranav, please get in touch with my coordinator immediately. How many hours you need to spend? Now I think at least three to four hours daily because only four weeks is left. So you need to spend at least, at least three to four hours daily and more on weekends. I will only review one mock of the paid students. If you want additional mocks to be checked, there is a small fees for it. I will let you know. Is it possible that one technical article could be examined in the same exam. What do you mean? So normally technical article, it is just tested once and that's it. So there is no chance of repetition. 
So Riz Khan, yes, Riz Khan is asking that what about one-to-one -one exhibit? If there is any information which is there pertaining to some other requirements, no big deal. When you're reading a one is to one exhibit and you found you find out that there is some interesting information which you can use in some other question, just copy it and go and put it there. Include it, you can go back and edit your answer, right? The chances are less. This happens very rarely. But in case you find something, information which you can use in some other exhibit, just use it there. What's the big deal? Yes, az Azade, it's very, very important. Yes, Vivek, I answered that, right? Chrissy, no. Please follow the papers I have mentioned on my study plan. Do not do any questions outside that. Will we do the mocks in live class? Yes, I will conduct live mocks, four hours live mocks. Yes, on the CBE platform, sometimes there are formatting issues. So that's bad luck, then you will have to type, right? If you're not able to copy paste or they're formatting. Formatting issues is a no big deal because the examiner knows that there are formatting issues. So he will not deduct mark for formatting issues, okay? Mushtaq, uh, yes, it is possible, but low chances. Akshi, I don't think so. What is the difference between an accountant and a CFO? I really don't know. Figure it out yourself. Do I have any predictions? No, I don't have any predictions because this is not possible to predict. Yes, Eddie Vale. All right, so I guess uh, we are done. Please, you know, follow this study plan. All of you only follow, practice these questions. If no question is mentioned, it's, if any question is not mentioned here, stay away from it. Okay, this is your Bible. This is your study plan uh, for self-study students. For my life uh, regular students, we will be doing this schedule, okay? All right, guys, so thank you so much for joining me on this two days webinar. I really hope that the points by Rahul, who was the global prize winner, since he is a student himself, try to understand his points as well. And from now, you have to devote serious three to four hours every day, whether you are a working student or a full-time student, minimum three to four hours, otherwise it will be very, very difficult, right? So uh, those of you who want to enroll in my revision batch, you have one day tomorrow, please enroll. And I will see all of my paid students on Tuesday, 9th of May, 7 p.m. Pakistan time, with a practice of case study number one called co-fold construction. Thank you very much once again. You guys take care and good night.